President's Day event at Belfort, Washington's largest furniture and mattress store. Good morning, America. FBI showdown with the White House. The FBI now says they have grave concerns about that classified GOP memo on the Russia investigation. Will President Trump release it anyway? How will the FBI director respond? And why the president's communications director, Hope Hicks, is facing new scrutiny in the Russia investigation. Bitter blast. A new Arctic invasion heading for the Midwest already covered in snow. From the Super Bowl city, Minneapolis, to Michigan. And now a storm moving east, bringing bone-chilling cold to millions. And flames on a plane. <coughs> a terrifying moment, a charger burst. Passengers desperately trying to put out the fire with water bottles as smoke fills the cabin. ABC News exclusive. YouTube star Logan Paul, followed by millions of kids, sits down with Michael in his first TV interview since posting that alarming video. Was there a point when you said, hmm, maybe, maybe this is not a good decision? His apology, what he wants to happen next, only on GMA this morning. Live in Times Square, this is GMA with Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, and Michael Strahan. And we do say good morning, America, and a lot of parents interested in what Logan Paul has to say. Michael's on his way back from that interview. Yeah, it's good to see that he's sitting down, taking those questions. We'll be coming up to that in just a little bit. We also have a lot of other news mm -hmm. to get to, starting with that high-stakes battle over the classified Republican memo that criticizes the FBI and the Justice Department over the Russia investigation. President Trump wants to release to the public the FBI has questions about its accuracy and the compromising of classified information. Our senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega has all the latest on the showdown. Good morning, Cecilia. George, good morning to you. That memo this morning is right here at the White House. And despite that warning from the FBI, sources here tell us the president is still expected to release it. As soon as today, President Trump's showdown with his own FBI director could come to a head if he releases that controversial classified memo accusing the Justice Department of political bias. The microphone's catching the president's pledge to a Republican congressman. Let's release the memo. Oh, yeah. oh, don't worry. It's 100%. And Chief of Staff John Kelly promising the same. It'll be released here pretty quick, I think, and every, the whole world can see it. But in an extraordinary public clash with the White House, the FBI warned against against releasing that memo, saying officials only had a limited chance to review it and, quote, we have grave concerns about material omissions of fact that fundamentally impact the memo's accuracy. Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee wrote the four-page memo, and sources tell ABC News it alleges the Justice Department acted inappropriately when it obtained a surveillance warrant to spy on a Trump campaign advisor suspected of being a Russian agent. While some Republicans say the memo casts a shadow over the integrity of the Russia investigation, Democrats are outraged. This is the President of the United States acting to defend himself legally and politically at the expense of our national security. And now this morning, new allegations of President Trump demanding yet another loyalty pledge from a top law enforcement official involved in that Russia probe. This was the man overseeing the special counsel inquiry, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, testifying before congressional investigators in December. So nobody's asked me to take a loyalty pledge other than the oath of office. But a source tells ABC News the president recently asked if Rosenstein was, quote, on his team. The president also allegedly wanted to know about the direction of that Russia probe. Questions catching Rosenstein by surprise. So this now appears to be the third loyalty pledge asked by President Trump. Of course, there was f former FBI Director James Comey. Sources tell us the president also asked former acting director Andrew McCabe how he voted in 2016. George, you know this, the big question this morning, will his current FBI director stay on the job in the middle of this clash if the president decides to go around him and release this memo? A departure of a second FBI director would be an absolutely astounding development. It here. would be extraordinary, Cecilia. Meanwhile, it comes with this memo being right in the middle of all these uh, questions. There are now questions about whether the House Intelligence Committee actually worked with the White House in preparing the memo. 
Yeah, the top Republican on that committee, uh, the chairman, was asked point blank during a hearing this week whether anyone on his staff worked with the White House, was in touch with the White House uh, about this memo and writing it. He refused to answer that question. He is also now under fire from the top Democrat on that committee, George, who is accusing uh, Chairman Nunes of secretly altering that memo before sending it to the White House. Nunes' team says that there were just minor edits. Right, and he's been accused of improperly working with the White House before. Okay, Cecilia, thanks very much, Robin. And George, there are also new questions about Hope Hicks and the Russia investigation. The president's communications director facing new scrutiny over comments she may have made about that Trump Tower meeting with Russians. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, is here and has more. Good morning, Pierre. Robin, good morning. Explosive new allegations from the one-time spokesman for the Trump legal team, putting him at direct conflict with the White House. This morning, White House Communications Director Hope Hicks under fire. At issue, that controversial statement written by Don Jr. about the reason for the infamous Trump Tower meeting with a group of Russians during the summer of 2016. Don Jr. released a statement saying the meeting was primarily about Russian adoptions. But we later learned that the meeting was for the Trump campaign to receive dirt about Hillary Clinton from Vladimir Putin to help Trump win the election. Hope Hicks and other White House advisors, along with the president, decided to help Don Jr. write a response while on board Air Force One during a flight back from the G20 summit after learning that the New York Times knew about the Trump Tower meeting. ABC News has learned that Mark Corallo, at the time the spokesman for the Trump legal team, became concerned about the statement's misleading nature. This morning, the New York Times is reporting about a tense conversation with Hope Hicks in which Corallo alleges that Hicks knew the real reason for the Trump Tower meeting, i.e. to get it dirt on Hillary Clinton, strange. and told him that it would never get out. Corallo was apparently concerned that the misleading statement would create the perception of obstruction of justice. After Corallo's concerns about obstruction were published in that new book by Michael Wolff, ABC News first learned that the special counsel contacted Corallo for an interview. But a lawyer for Hicks has released a statement to the New York Times flatly denying Corallo's account. And as always, the key question, what did the president know and when did he know it? Just one of so many questions, Pierre. Thank you. And that's one of the questions Robert Mueller is looking at. Let's talk to our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, about this right now. So you've got this meeting on Air Force One. The president's there. Hope Hicks, one of his closest aides, is there. Don Trump Jr. is on the phone. It turns out to be a misleading statement. So the big question there is, would the president being involved in basically lying to the public be part of an obstruction of justice case? Uh, it could be. Uh, certainly any lies can be part of an obstruction case, right? When you're putting together possible obstruction, you're putting together Together different pieces and lies become part of those pieces. But remember, in the case of Bill Clinton, when Ken Starr uh, recommended the articles of impeachment, one of them was strictly based on lying to the public. Now, I don't think that would be the case here, just a lie in and of itself. But one piece. Right, but it becomes an important piece in the puzzle, if true. Let's talk about uh, the showdown between the FBI and the White House right now. At the heart of it, th this dossier, right. uh, which um, implicated uh, the excuse me, that was used in this, uh, right now, excuse me, I got a little confused, right here, the dossier the Republicans are saying is biased, and that's why it shouldn't have been used to get scrutiny of Carter Page, the Trump campaign. And they're official. saying it was paid for, right? I mean, mm -hmm. part of their argument is that, that it was paid for by the Clinton campaign, and therefore it can't be trusted. Let's take this out of the politics and bring it into the law uh, for a minute, which is, let's assume for a minute that that dossier was used. Let's assume that was part of the reason they were able to get a warrant. As a legal matter, this happens every day. Every day, there are snitches and criminals and thieves and people with agendas who provide information that is used to get warrants in this country. That's just not unusual. So for this to have any real bite, they're going to have to be able to show, A, that it was basically entirely this dossier which is what led them to get the warrant, and B, they're going to have to be able to show that there was political motivation, not just on the part of the people paying for it, but on the part of the people who were requesting the information in some way, shape, or form, and I think that's going to be very hard. Pierre, you've been covering the Justice Department an awful long time. This showdown between the FBI and the White House, extraordinary. It is, George. Think about yesterday. The FBI put out this unusual statement in which the FBI director and his team were trying to point out two things. Number one, they were telling the House Republicans, your report is crap. It's nothing. It's not based on any good, sound information. Number two, number two, he was telling the President of the United States, I disagree with what you're about to do. 
is the first sign that he's trying to signal independence, and we'll see how it turns out, the George. Me the memo also critical of Rod Rosenstein, who now is reported to have gotten this loyalty, this request for loyalty yeah. from the president as well, and one of the questions there is, would the report then become the basis for the firing of Rod Rosenstein? And, and you know, that would be monumental. Remember, Rod Rosenstein, many believe, is the one thing standing between Robert Mueller and a job. Uh, right now. And if Rod Rosenstein is gone, many believe that the next person to have that position would be someone who would be very willing and ready to fire Robert Mueller. So if you view Rosenstein as a, as a sort of piece of the Mueller investigation, it's a critical, critical question. Dan Abrams, Pierre Thomas, thanks very much. Okay, George, now to those storms on the move, bringing snow to the east and the Arctic plunge moving into the Midwest just in time for the Super Bowl. Ginger, wind chill expected to d drop below zero in Minneapolis? Well below zero. Minneapolis is going to show off and show the world what they can do cold and snow-wise. After a nearly snowless start to the season, they're catching up. The month of January has been good to them in that snow drought, and you can see a couple of inches fell between yesterday morning and last night. Now that has moved to the east, it will move through here this afternoon through tonight and early tomorrow morning. And it's really this. It's the cold that settles in. Look at Detroit, seven below, Cincinnati, one below. And that Sunday that everybody's concerned about, 19 below, Robin. At least they'll be inside, but you got to get there. You got to get there. You got to get there to <laughs> yeah. the stadium. Thank you, Ginger. Okay, we're going to move on now to that deadly train crash in Virginia. More than 100 Republican lawmakers were on board when the train collided with a garbage truck. Several lawmakers with MDs scrambled to help the injured, and the NTSB is now investigating. NBC's Lindsay Dennis is on the scene in Crozet, Virginia. Good morning, Lindsay. Good morning, George. You can see that devastating crash scene behind me. That garbage truck split in two, trash everywhere. Some of those lawmakers who are also medical professionals jumping into action to help the injured, but they were unable to save one man. This morning, authorities identifying 28-year-old Christopher Foley as the man who died in the deadly train crash in Virginia. Mass casualty incident level one. Train versus truck. The train packed with more than 100 lawmakers, their staffers and families was traveling from Washington to a GOP retreat at the Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia when it slammed into a garbage truck. Foley was a passenger on that truck. Boom, jarring type of both sound and feeling. Uh, strange, almost like an explosion. We're going to the to the helicopter right now. A group of lawmakers who are also doctors scrambling to help the injured. I got blood on my shirt, so forgive me. I did CPR, and um, you know, it just didn't, didn't look good for him. And, but the other gentlemen, we were able to keep a pulse. Senators Jeff Flake and Bill Cassidy helping those rendering medical aid carry this wounded passenger on a stretcher. A scene eerily familiar for those on hand when a gunman opened fire at a Republican baseball practice in June. I thought after that time I never want to experience a day like this again. And uh, unfortunately it came, came too soon. In total, six people, including Minnesota Congressman Jason Lewis, who suffered a concussion, were sent to the hospital. This morning, one person in critical condition. The NTSB is trying to figure out why that truck was on the tracks despite there being crossing gates here. They expect to recover two data recorders from the train. As for those Republican lawmakers, they are now on their retreat. They began with a prayer for the victims. Robin? Mm -hmm. And we pray as well. All right, Lindsay, thank you. Let's go now to new concerns about what's become the worst flu season in years. A consulting firm estimates that the virus could lead to $9.4 billion in lost productivity as a million Americans miss at least four days of work. ABC's Lindsay Davis here with the latest. And Lindsay, the number of cases just keeps growing. They certainly do. Good morning to you, George. Using data from smart thermometers, the health tech company Kinza has been tracking the flu spread of, or the spread of flu-like illnesses since the beginning of January until now. You can see the map grows red to illustrate just how many people are sick up 23% from last week to this week alone. The data suggests more than 16 million people or 5% of the population might be infected. This morning, health officials confirm several more child flu deaths across the United States, including 15-year-old Kira Molina of Noonan, Georgia. On January 30th at 7.07 .07 a.m., Ms. Molina succumbed to liver failure due to the flu. In Marietta, Georgia, five-year-old Eli Snook died due to complications from the virus. He'd been experiencing flu-like symptoms for two weeks, even briefly returning to school before taking a turn for the worse. 
school called me and said that he had 101 degree fever. Cases are also being reported in New Jersey. A four year old girl and a 10 year old boy in California both now confirmed to have died from the flu. This <laughs> as doctors and clinics across the country try to stave off what officials say is one of the worst flu seasons in nearly a decade, offering free flu shots at this clinic in Florida. In New York, this doctor tells us the rapid tests used to quickly diagnose flu are in short supply. If somebody feels that they're, they're getting sick, they, they, should, they should go see a doctor and, and they, they, don't, they don't need a test to be treated. In New Hampshire, 38-year-old mother of four Amanda Franks chose to forego taking the prescribed antiviral medication after she was diagnosed with the flu because she was worried about side effects. She was just getting rest and fluids and doing everything that she thought was right. Two days later, she got sicker and died on her way to the hospital. And while side effects of Tamiflu can include headache, nausea, and vomiting, health officials say serious side effects are rare and it is proven to be effective. And that just heart-wrenching story with that mom. They were planning on taking her by helicopter to the, air, uh, to the hospital, uh, but weather uh, grounded the helicopter, and then she died on the way to the hospital. So tragic. Thank you, Lindsay. All right. Coming down to the Super Bowl now. It's just three days away. Minneapolis is tightening up security. TJ, got a bird's-eye view of how the city is preparing. Good morning, TJ. Hey, good morning to you, Robin. Of course, we have thousands of officers on the ground trying to protect the people in Minneapolis, but you got six of these babies that are going to be in the air. U.S. Customs and Border Protection's Air and Marine Unit, which is normally having the job of keeping illegal things out of the country, well, they have the job of making sure everything stays out of a particular 32-mile radius around U.S. Bank Stadium on Sunday. Well, 100 million people watch the big game, these guys will watch the skies above it. Customs and Border Protection's Air and Marine Unit patrolling in Black Hawks will intercept any aircraft that flies too close to U.S. Bank Stadium during the Super Bowl. We want to keep the American people safe, right? We want viewers to just enjoy the day, relax, and have the state of mind that somebody's out there watching potential targets. That's just one layer of security for the Super Bowl, a level one national security event, the highest designation. Homeland Security Secretary Kristen Nielsen came to town to get an update on security preps. We have absolutely no credible or specific information, but we're actively monitoring, as you say. So real time, we're talking with our international partners, state and local, and all of our federal assets to make sure that, uh, that it will be a safe and secure fun day. Well, you have all this coordination, all these agencies, helicopters that'll be in the air, everybody concerned about security. But you know what, guys? One of the biggest security concerns they have, the weather. Yes, you heard Ginger talking about it. But as I speak to you this morning, it's too below here in Minneapolis. That causes some special concerns about even moving people around, getting around traffic. But, all, but for the helicopters, they love it. They said it's good for their aircraft to actually be in that cold air. So it's at least good for somebody. Good for somebody. Glad they're benefiting from that. Um, speaking of security, we remember Tom Brady's jersey was stolen last year in the victory of the Super Bowl. What is the plan to protect his uniform this time around, TJ? Well, C Customs and Border Protection can't do anything about the jersey, but they are putting a lot of special attention security, and Brady himself said he will not let that out of his sight if they win this game on Sunday. <laughs> not this year. No. Okay, TJ, thanks very much. Let's go to Ginger. Another storm coming this weekend. Yes, so from now, Virginia through Rhode Island, that rain and snow for tonight through tomorrow, but you get another one if you travel Sunday into Monday. Watch out for that one. Your local weather in 30 seconds. First, the wind chill forecast brought to you by Edward Jones. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hey, how's the college visit? He remembers. It's good. Does it make the shortlist? You remember that too. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Knowing what's important to you. It's okay. This is what we've been planning for. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That's what's important to us. It's why 7 million investors work with Edward Jones. Temperatures today staying above average in the low 50s will stay dry through about uh, the rush hour commute, then talking some rain. Changing over to some snow late tonight into early tomorrow morning. Little to no accumulation. It will be a blustery Friday with those temperatures in the 30s. Dry on Saturday and then our next weather maker arrives on Sunday. Could start out with some snow changing over to rain. Notice those daytime highs for your Super Bowl Sunday in the low 40s.
skiing above the clouds. That's mm. I just want to ski right now. Like, that's all I'm dreaming about. But this is South Lake Tahoe, and inversion sets up there. The clouds so pretty. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous. Thanks so much, Ginger. Coming up, that ABC News exclusive with Logan Paul, the YouTube star with millions of followers, sitting down with Michael for his first interview since posting that video that got so much backlash. And we'll tell you what's next for him. You'll see it only here on GMA this morning. And Nicole Eggert is stepping over a fight with Scott Bale over those accusations of abuse. That's after his interview right here on GMA. What difference does it make where it comes from? New phones for the family.